G'day everybody, how are you going today? It is so good to see you. I do hope that you are super well. Today I want to talk about CF Express. There is type A, type B and type C. Although I'm not sure anybody's actually produced a type C, but we certainly do have type A and type B. Sony are the only company that uses type A and Canon, Nikon, Fuji, DJI and others use type B. In this video we're going to learn how CF Express just got a whole lot better. CF Express was a standard that kicked off in 2016. It was put together by the Compact Flash Association. Before CF Express Type B, we actually had these cards right here, which are XQD made by the same standards association. Now the interesting thing about XQD is it has the same pinning and the same form factor as CF Express Type B. So Nikon users have been able to use these size cards since the Nikon D4 in 2012. And what's also exciting about CF Express Type B is XQD cards are compatible with the most modern of cameras. So this is a standard for Nikon users that's been around for over a decade, sort of, sort of, when it comes to form factor, but not when it comes to size and speed. And this is where the implementation of CF Express became super interesting. Now, CF Express, as I said, was first ratified in 2016, but it didn't get rolled out into the market and actually start to be produced and released until 2019. So it took another couple of years for CF Express Type B to actually start to replace XQD for Nikon users, Canon users, maybe some DJI users. But what has happened overall to the CF Express standard is it's been updated from version 2.0 to 4.0. And what does that mean? Well, the most significant part of this update is it is a doubling in speed. And like, well, that's pretty crazy because for CF Express Type A and Type B users, these cards were already really fast. Type A kept out at around one gigabyte per second, and Type B kept out at two gigabytes per second of potential read and write speeds. Now, these are theoretical, of course. This is what the bus, the logic, the architecture, that's what they can handle. But in recent years and months, we've seen cards that have come very close to those speeds, up in the 1,800 and 1,900 megabytes per second. With this doubling, this actually changes the landscape for what camera manufacturers can do. And I want to speculate and theorize a little bit about what that means for potential camera creations. Now, Sony, for the time being, have hitched their ride on Type A, the Type A variant that currently runs at one gigabyte maximum. And that's fine for almost every use case that these cameras that use Type A, there is nothing that needs faster. So that kind of makes sense. Although it does become a little bit of a bottleneck when you want the ultimate in highest frame rates and you just want endless buffers or you want to do interesting things with 8K video. Different types of RAW codecs and, and what you want your bit depths to be. By doubling the bandwidth, that suddenly opens up a whole new array that manufacturers can do. For example, the Sony A1, yes, it does shoot at 30 frames per second, but it shoots at 30 frames per second, not at 14 bit. It's at 12 and something bit. I don't know the exact number. If you know, let me know in the comments below. Now, this may have to do with what they wanted the buffer to do. This may be to do with what the processor can do. It also may be to do with what the storage can do. All of these things are gonna be optimized to work together. And then something we know about the Nikon Z9, which shoots 20 frames per second, but it does it at 14 bit, it never drops that bit rate. Depending on which cards you use, you can have an extraordinarily long buffer. And if you shoot on high efficiency star with your Nikon camera, which manages to make your files around about 60% of the size due to this extraordinary compression, with some cards, there is kind of almost an endless buffer when shooting 14 bit RAW high efficiency star. And this is in essence what this is saying to us, if you can get the images off the sensor, through the processor and onto the storage, maybe going through a buffer, we're not 100% sure what's going on there, 
then the camera can go forever. But what we can see is if you have slower storage, it does seem to slow down. And this is where the architecture of how you build cameras, if your storage is so fast that you, in essence, don't need a buffer anymore because you just go straight from sensor to processor to storage, then your camera becomes as fast as your storage is. And that is when this story gets really, really interesting. What we're saying here with CF Express Type B, it is now gone from two gigabytes as the theoretical maximum limit to four gigabytes, doubling the bandwidth. So I suppose what that means is if you've got a 20 frame per second limit on your Z9 and that's shooting at 14 bit and that's with the files going straight through to the card and whatever the card can handle, then this theoretically says to us that if you use the same architecture, but you just upgrade the pathways, and obviously it means how fast the information can come off the sensor. Of course, we know the Z9 sensor is still the fastest in the market. So that is memory on the back of the sensor and then the pathways. Now pathways, look, I'm not a computer scientist. I did study computer science a long time ago. You just increase the freeways. You don't necessarily have to make a lot of it faster. You just add more lanes on your freeway. And this is why they talk about PCI lanes. This is allowing data to travel in parallel. So does this mean with cameras that can utilize CF Express 4.0, we're gonna have a doubling of what we can do. Now, in regards to stills, well, yes, 40 frames per second. And I actually think there's a bit more bandwidth in there. So it might be 50, it might be 60. I think a Z9 II, if and when it comes, will certainly do way more, way more, and I think when we're going this fast, way more is 30 or 40 or 50. It's not like seven times more. It's like one and a half or two times more. I think it will do way more than it's doing today. Now, CF Express 4.0 is backwardly compatible, so we can still use all of our investment of old cards. So any cameras that come next, and this has just been ratified, Sony, Canon, Nikon, they are all part of this association. So they will now all be able to roll it into their latest hardware. And we talked about it in a recent video where, well, we kind of think there should be a Canon R1 at some point. There will be a Sony A12 at some point, and there certainly will be a Z92 at some point, if history shows us what will happen next. For example, We've had the Nikon D1, D2, D3, D4, D5, D6, and so on. We would expect this to happen, and we've already had the Z6 and the Z62 and the Z7 and the Z72. So yeah, I think we can safely say there will be a Z92. This has just been ratified. I don't think there's gonna be a Z92, anything short of, let's say two years, maybe three years. Some people have speculated they might try and get back to the releasing around the Olympics, which means a Z92 might come sooner for next year's Olympics. I'm not so sure about that. Maybe, might, might not happen. Regardless of whether that happens or not, that camera, I am absolutely confident. I think seeing as Nikon a part of this association, they would have been able to make this camera that's maybe one, two, three years away, be able to include the new CF Express 4.0 ratification in that camera. Very exciting. So that's what it does to stills. We're gonna be able to go even faster. And I do think if we're living in this world that we're currently living in now, if you're just talking straight from the sensor to the processor to the card, then you can keep increasing buffer depth just based on whichever card you buy. And if you buy the fastest ones, the buffer can go on longer. Anyway, that's just a theory of mine. It was a theory when the Z9 came out and we started playing with it and I felt how fast it was. And everybody was getting pretty different buffer results based on cards. Well, that sort of says cards, doesn't it? Who knows? There may well be some form of buffer in there, but there also could be logic that says, this card is so fast, let's just, let's just not worry about the buffer and let's just go straight to the card. It's possible. But the processor certainly has to do some things. We know in regards to the Tico RAW, which is what's running the HE Star, that's got to go through compression on its way to the card and it is doing it at a blinding speed. 
which says to me that there are cores on the XP7 which are specifically designed for the Tico compression. And that moves me over to video because Nikon's raw video, which is in this, the Z8 60 frames per second raw video, is also based on Tico raw. And if you're going to be doing 60 frames per second, yes, it is at 12 bit, not at 14. That's okay. They are doing 60 frames a second, which is a lot then you definitely need dedicated processes that are just doing your compression. It's clear that's happening because it is moving at such a speed. So what does this mean for video? Well, you double, you double that. So does that mean we might be able to get 8K, 120 frames raw, 8K, 120 frames raw. That would be epic. Some people would use it. I would, I would actually use it. I would prefer to use 8K in the few times that I, shoot 120 rather than four because I like being able to move around the frame. I know people think I'm crazy, but I actually use this punching in and punching out all the time. As a solo filmmaker, which I am the majority of the time, it's imperative to be able to create these zooms and these cuts and these jumps and to reframe just as a creative tool. It's also great for my clients and to have that level of power in the camera that might come next. Well, this ratification of CF Express 4.0 may well be giving us some hints as to what to expect next. Now, I have every reason to believe that Sony will continue down the path that they are. They will stick with Type A because what it allows them to do is have an SD slot and a Type A slot essentially in the same slot, kind of. And look, it's really smart. I think it's really smart except for the fact that the cards are quite small and, well, they are half the speed of Type B and they're still half the speed. They've all doubled. But giving the Sonys double the speed, well, it's just as exciting for the Sonys as it is for the CF Express Type B users. There might be some things that Canon, Fuji, Nikon, DJI can do speed-wise, codec-wise, absolute frame rate-wise, that if Sony, who stick with the slower one, just can't do. But let's be clear here. It's, it's like, this is like the Sony autofocus discussion, but with frame rates and uh, high-end codecs, the use case, the use case of requiring bleeding edge AF, because now they're all so close, is becoming so small. Like the, the difference in people that will actually see the difference, it's so small. And it's the same here with this. Who needs 40, 50, 60 frames per second in stills? Who needs 8K at 120 frames per second? Like realistically, who needs it? This is not a fail moment for Sony. Some people might say that sort of thing, but it's not the fact that they've chosen to use Type A. Yes, it's slower but this is right at the very tip top bleeding edge. And I think at the kind of level of cameras that we're talking about, which is 35 millimeter mirrorless hybrid cameras, we just, at the end of the day, for the price point that we pay for this gear, we just can't really be expecting too much more to come out of these cameras when it comes to speed. If we talk about say the Z9, the Z8 and the A1, they're kind of the fastest cameras on the market. And if we talk about speed, and, 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 and please, let's talk about this in the comments below. If we talk about speed, what else does anybody need or want, okay? There will be a very small number of use case people that go out there that jump in the comments and say, oh yes, I want 50 frames per second raw 14 bit. Or they might say, I want 20 frames per second 16 bit raw. And that is where faster cards will help because you'll be able to go from 14 bit to 16 bit. But I'm not sure Nikon, Canon, or Sony will give us 16-bit in the 35 mil space at those ultra high speeds. Do we really need it? That's a discussion that I'd love to have in the comments below. Let's talk about 14-bit versus 16-bit in the all-rounder mirrorless 35 mil space. At the end of the day, I kind of, I'm hard pressed to see that absolute speed, whether we need that much more of it. And I suppose personally, I would like to see 16 bit versus 14 bit rather than going from 20 or 30 frames a second to 50 or 60 frames per second. I think the majority of use cases would actually prefer more of that. The interesting thing to me is I'm just, I'm not quite sure whether we will see it in this space because that's not what these cameras 
are kind of designed for. They're kind of designed as all-rounder cameras. Fuji and Hasselblad, other manufacturers, giving us 16-bit files, which tend to be in larger than 35 millimeter. I do think there's one manufacturer, at least, that gives us 16-bit. I can't remember who that is right at this moment. Please, if you know, write it in the comments below. That's in 35 mil. I think someone does give us that. Double the bandwidth of our storage. This has happened. This has now been ratified. Everybody's got access to it. Sony, Nikon, and Canon. What does this mean? They're giving us way more, like double. Double gives us so much more because if you think about all the higher specs on the highest end cameras, doubling them, I think is more than most of us could ever possibly want. Do you want 8K at 120 frames per second in RAW on a Z9 II? Do you want 40 or 50 frames per second in 14-bit RAW? Do you want 60 frames per second on your Sony a1 II in 12 and whatever bit that it is. Do we need any of this stuff? I'm not sure we do, who knows? But what we're getting is the doubling of the capacity of CF Express Type B, CF Express Type A, CF Express Type C, which I don't think anyone's built any of those yet. I'd love to know what you think about this. I'm really excited about it. I, I'm, I'm just a technology nerd, so I love it when technology just keeps advancing. I love the fact that it's got the same physical size. It's got the same logic. So everything is absolutely backward compatible. That's exciting. That to me is smart design and all these companies and more, they worked on it almost 10 years ago to get it to this point. We are very lucky people that this just this technology it just keeps blasting along honestly it's just moving at such a pace as someone who's been in this game for four decades it still it still just continues to blow my mind and what's interesting about this is it's all driven from nvme this is a homemade cf express type b card and you buy this shell for like 19 dollars, and then you put the smallest sized nvme ram in it just like you stick in your computer or you might stick in a little hard drive enclosure. This is just NVMe. The computer industry, well, they love to keep marching on. They love to keep making everything faster so we keep upgrading. Well, the camera industry is using exactly the same tech. This is the same tech in a different housing. They've just put it in an enclosure. So while the computer industry marches on, what we're doing, the camera industry, the processors that are in these machines, the XP7, which I can feel is a crazy fast processor, well, it's got access to this same PC technology that just keeps marching along. This is standard 4.0. Does that mean we might get a standard 5.0 in another three or four years time that's double again? We might. And whether we need it, I don't know. I don't know. I suppose the next step after 8K is 12K, of which there are 12K cameras out there. I think Blackmagic make 12K. I do think it'll come at some point, maybe not in stills cameras, because the thing about 12K is you need a larger sensor. And I'm still convinced that the 45 megapixels, which the Z9, Z8, D850, Z7, Z7 II are, I'm convinced for now, until the fraction gets sorted out, which I'm positive they're working on, it's the sweet spot which means you can't go above 8K. It's, look at this as interesting stuff. I'm completely nerding out at this point, but I love it. It's exciting and it's all gonna keep marching forwards and that's just fun. Do you need to buy it? No, you don't. You do not. Your D750, your D600, your D3200, Sony A7R and so on. These are all still fine cameras and if the batteries still charge or you can still buy batteries for them, in no way is this a video that's trying to get you to buy anything. This is just really a video about wonder, the wonder of technology and how as image makers, both still and moving, it's astonishing what we have today. We're absolutely spoiled. And well, this new ratification just says to me, it's just gonna keep getting even more and more amazing. I can't wait. It's like exploring the universe just to see where is this gonna go? You don't have to buy any of it, but where is it gonna go? I'd love to know your thoughts in the comments below. Please do share what you think about this subject. It's been so good to see you. And if this is your first time here, I'd love to see you again. So please do subscribe, please share, and please like. All right, bye for now.